I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation 3, and we're going to talk this morning about heaven and the new Jerusalem. And as we come into this subject this morning, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about the new Jerusalem. I, I will make references to heaven. A lot of times we, when we're speaking about heaven, we're speaking about the new Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, most of the information that is given to us in the scriptures about heaven are in reference to this city called the New Jerusalem, and not so much heaven in a broader sense of itself. And so there is a distinction, though. The New Jerusalem is in heaven, and one day it is going to leave heaven, and it is going to come to earth. So the new, so technically, the New Jerusalem is not heaven, but it is heaven, and it is in heaven. So I'm just saying that because I will use these terms possibly interchangeably through this lesson today, and I just want you to understand that, that it's appropriate to do that. In chapter 3 of Revelation, verse 12, the Bible says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go out no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. And so here we have a very clear confession of Jesus that there is this city called the New Jerusalem that's in heaven. And it is going to be removed from heaven in the future, and it is going to come down to earth. And so we're going to look at these things. In Revelation 21, if you will, we're going to read verses that pertain to this city. And so we're going to begin in verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And we're talking about this abiding in God's presence. And so this is, this is the city. Now what I want to talk about today is the new Jerusalem. And I want to build upon this over the next few weeks. Next week we're going to talk about our new bodies. What are these bodies like? What are they going to be able to do? How are they going to function? And then after that subject I want to talk about what happens when you die. What takes place in a person's life? If a believer dies, what happens to them? And if they're in heaven, what are they experiencing right now? Do they know things that are happening on the earth? So I want to talk about those things in the next couple of weeks that are coming up. Because I think this is also very important. I also want to talk about hell and what happens when an unbeliever dies. And what takes place with them and what are they familiar with? So here in this new Jerusalem, I do want to say to you, for us to function in it properly, we're going to need new bodies. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 that corruption cannot inherit incorruption. Uh, or incorruption cannot inherit that. And so we're going to have incorruptible bodies, immortal bodies. Now, continuing with the new Jerusalem, I want to begin in verse 9 of chapter 21. And what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to read from the Living Bible right now. So if you're following with me, I want you to know that I'm reading from the Living Bible because it kind of moves the measurements into understanding terms for us. Then one of the seven angels said to me, come with me and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. So if you're interested in who the lamb's wife is, you're about to find out. In a vision, he took me to a towering mountain peak, and from there I watched that wondrous city, the holy Jerusalem, descending 
out from the skies from God. As the King James says, out of heaven from God. It was filled with the glory of God and flashed and glowed like a precious gem. Crystal clear like jasper. Its walls were broad and high with 12 gates guarded by 12 angels. And the names of the 12 tribes of Israel were written on the gates. There were three gates on each side, north, south, east, and west. The walls had 12 foundation stones. And on them were written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel held in his hand a golden measuring stick to measure the city and its gates and walls. When he measured it, he found it was a square as wide as it was long. In fact, it was in the form of a cube, for its height was exactly the same as its other dimensions. Now understand this, 1,500 miles each way. That's significant, 1,500 miles each way. So our jets fly at about, you know, thirty to 40,000 feet. We're talking miles. This is enormous. This is an enormous city. Then he measured the thickness of the walls and found them to be 216 feet across. An angel called out these measurements to me. Using standard units. The city itself was pure, transparent gold like glass. The wall was made of jasper and was built on 12 layers of foundation stones inlaid with gems. And it talks about all of these different stones that I'm going to skip because I can't pronounce most of these stones' names. And you would probably just laugh at me trying. Verse 21. The twelve gates were made of pearls, each gate from a single pearl. And the main street was pure, transparent gold like glass. No temple could be seen in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are worshipped in it everywhere. And the city has no need of sun or moon to light it, for the glory of God and of the Lamb illuminate it. Its light will light the nations of the earth, and the rulers of the world will come and bring their glory to it. Its gates never close. They stay open all day long, and there is no night. And the glory and honor of all the nations shall be brought into it. Nothing evil will be permitted in it. No one immoral or dishonest, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And I pray to God that yours is. In chapter 22, continuing about the city, he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servant shall serve him. And they shall see his face. And his name shall be in their foreheads. And if you ever wondered, will we see God? Can God be seen? You're going to see his face. You're going to see God face to face. That is a beautiful promise. More than anything else about this city... I'm going to see God face to face. Wow. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And so this is it. This is the description, the most clear and the the, the most lengthy description we have about this city that is in heaven called the New Jerusalem. And we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning, because I think it is imperative for us to understand this. The Bible says, set your affection on things above where your life is. And so it's very hard to set your affections on something that is not real to you. 
something that you don't think about a lot, something you don't study a lot. I would even beg to ask the question, when was the last time anyone here, don't show, don't show it this by response, that anyone studied Revelation 21 and studied the city and just tried to understand it and try to perceive it and what life is going to be like. It's a fascinating study. And it's in the Bible because God wants us to know about it. And I believe it will cause our affections to rise and say, wow, I want to be there. You know, I want to go there. You can talk to me about different places in America and describe it to me with such beauty. And I would probably say, I'd love to go visit there. But I'm talking about heaven. I'm talking about the New Jerusalem, a place where I'm going to see God's face. Oh, I can't wait. But your name has to be written in the Lamb's book of life. You have to be saved and you have to be born again or this is not going to be your future. Your future is going to be dark and your future is going to be torturous and your future is going to be away from the glory of God and you're not going to see God. And so Jesus came so that we could all be with him and I pray that you know this. I also would say that just really until recently, I would say over the last several decades, this subject of heaven was immensely important to the church. And I believe that it still is in various parts of the world. It's just not that important to Americans and Europeans, probably because we live in such comfort and we have such conveniences that make life for us very appealing. People don't want to die. People don't want to go to heaven. Americans don't want to go to heaven, that's for sure. I mean, we saw that by and large. One third of the evangelical Christians left the church last year. Barna says they're not coming back. We're we're all about preserving and keeping this life. The early church was all about going home, you know, not prematurely, you understand. But the Bible says our days are numbered by God. And so your day has a number on it. It doesn't matter what you do. When that number comes, God's bringing you home. And so to live in this, to live in the expectancy of this and the hope of this is such a blessed promise. And heaven was so central to the people of God throughout the Bible, throughout history, actually, because the thought of heaven was not new. It was not something that just came about since Jesus came or since John went there to tell us about it. As a matter of fact, the subject of heaven goes all the way back to the to the earliest days of humanity. And nobody really grasped it probably more effectively than Job, who was probably one of the oldest people ever written about in the Bible. As a matter of fact, Moses had to write his story. And Job had this incredible hope of heaven. Job had this incredible expectation that I'm going to see God in my own flesh. And so I will not curse him. I will not do anything. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We came into this world with nothing. We'll leave with nothing, but I'm going to see God. And so Job had that hope, and it was passed down to them. The belief in heaven is an important belief if you are going to endure suffering for Jesus Christ. If perhaps you're called upon to pay the price for your faith, pay the price for your Christianity, Maybe with your own blood, maybe with imprisonment, maybe with beatings and torturings. Then I believe heaven has to be a very great reality to you. It was to the early believers. The Bible tells us they endured because they believed in that city. We haven't faced that kind of hostility. I don't know if that's really something that is part of the faith that causes us To suffer martyrdom for Christ. But it sure is the case in the Bible. These people that were willing to put their faith on the line. And die for this. Believed in that city. They believed in that eternal home. And I want to look at a few scriptures that talk about it. Hebrews chapter 10. And as you're turning there. I want you to understand that. Because heaven wasn't just a nice idea. I mean heaven was it. It was everything. In Hebrews chapter 10, Paul is very worried about believers who are throwing their faith away because of persecution. The persecution that Christians are going through right now in Hebrews is a persecution that originates over law and faith and grace. 
The believers are living by grace and they're living by faith. But these leaders come along and they compel the believers to go back to Moses. Include Moses with your faith. But don't throw Moses away. And now because of that living by grace, they were being persecuted. They were being exiled. They were being thrown out of their homes and out of the marketplaces. And they couldn't work and they couldn't labor. They couldn't sell things or buy things. It was horrible. And so many of them were abandoning their faith and taking Moses back up. And this was dangerous. And this is what Paul writes into when he says this in verse 34. And he says, for you had compassion of me. In my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Now listen to that. It's not because knowing in your church doctrinal statement. It's because you have an inner knowing of this. It is real to you. You really believe it. It is in you. The fact of heaven, the life of heaven. And why wouldn't it be? Jesus lives in you. The Holy Spirit lives in you. He came from heaven. He's going back to heaven. He's all about heaven. And he lives in you. So he puts your affections there. And, 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 and beloved, possibly that's the way. How are you going to endure the spoiling of your goods? I mean, think about it. They took our First Amendment away. There's not even due process. They took our First Amendment away. Nobody gets that. They shut the mouth of the former president of the United States. He couldn't even challenge the election. They silenced him. Something was said to him. Something was done that shut his mouth. And everybody that was associated with him. You don't have the freedom to speak what you want to speak. And now, if you haven't noticed, they've taken the Fourth Amendment. The unlawful right to search and seizure. They raided Giuliani's apartment. They took all of his devices, all of his computers, of all of his clients and all of his information. And they seized these things without any type of of constitutional authority or right. You lost your First Amendment. You lost your Fourth Amendment. You think the Second and Third are protected? If they can come in and steal the president's attorney's All of his information, all of his private information. You think they can't come take your guns? We're so bold to talk about these things. They're doing this to one of the most high-profile people in our nation. Will you be subject to the spoiling of your goods? How do you know you'll do it? How do you know that you can endure that? Because heaven is in you, and it is real. And this is not your home, and you know it. In chapter 11, verse 10, it says... Speaking of Abraham, the man of faith, he said he looked for a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. In verse 13, it talks about others who died in the faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that They were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire, they long for a better country that is a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God For he has prepared for them a city. Isn't that beautiful? This is how the believers endured, guys, in the past. I believe it has to be essential in our faith. The Bible tells us in chapter 12 of Hebrews, verse 22. But you are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable company of angels. That's your home now. If you're a believer, it's not going to be, it is. That's why you can walk through this life as a pilgrim and as a stranger in it. You don't have to walk in fear. Jeff preached a great message recently about being delivered from fear. What do we as Christians have to fear? What do we have to fear? We have a lot to fear if our life is in this world. But if our life's not, there's no hold that anybody's got on me. Nothing. 
You don't have to fear threats. You don't have to fear man. You don't have to fear governments. You don't have to fear diseases. You don't have to fear pandemics. You have nothing to fear if you are a stranger and a pilgrim in this world. Your home is secure. Your citizenship is secure. In chapter 13, verse 14, the Bible says, For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Praise God. That's what we're doing. That's what we're seeking. And the devil hates this. I mean, the devil was evicted out of this city. The devil was cast out like lightning, thrown down to the earth from this city. And now this city is an invitation for humans to live in. How mean must he be to know that you guys are going to the place he was kicked out of? I don't want you to go there. I don't want you to be excited about it. I don't want you to know what it's really like. Because he knows what it's really like. And boy, he has taken a lot of the emphasis and a lot of the passion and a lot of the desire for this city away. Because people don't talk about it. And when people do talk about it, they don't talk about it accurately. I was in a church just recently and the pastor was up exhorting the people. And he was talking about heaven. And I I was just sitting around a bunch of younger people in the service, and he was talking about heaven. He said, I, how many of you want to go to heaven? I mean, I just can't wait to go to heaven. We're going to go to heaven, and we're just going to sing day and night for all of eternity around the throne of God. And I heard this one kid behind me say, I don't want to go there. I don't, that, I don't, that doesn't sound good to me. And I say, and, and that's not what heaven is like. But because we don't know, we give a portrayal of it that takes the enthusiasm of it away. In Revelation 21 and 22, the new earth and the new Jerusalem are portrayed as actual places with detailed physical descriptions. God talks about this city and he speaks specifically about dimensions and measurements and foundations. Because he is trying to tell us, don't view this as some vague, mystical land of fairy tales. This is a substantial city with substance. And you need to understand that. It is exactly that. It is 1,400 miles in cube, or 1,500 miles in cube. That's from Canada to Mexico. That's from the Appalachian Mountains to California coastline. That is huge. That goes up into outer space, 1,500 miles high. It goes up into outer space. This thing is absolutely huge, all right? And so this is how the Bible describes it. And if we reduce this to something less or something other than a place, then we are robbing Jesus' own words of their meaning. And what God wants us to know. We should open our eyes. And we should look around us at this present world. Because this is a valid reference point. For us envisioning the new Jerusalem. This earthly place. Is a valid reference point of trying to picture. What our eternal place is going to be like. Just like looking at your bodies right now. Is valid for me. To try to picture and understand what your immortal body is going to look like. I'm going to know Lauren in his glorified body. And so we have to understand these things. When we hear the word city, we shouldn't scratch our heads and say, I wonder what he means by that. He means city. That's what he means. I think God knows how to choose words. And he means cities, and this is what we should understand. Cities have buildings and streets and art and music and athletics and goods and services and events of all kinds. Of course, cities have people that are engaged in activities, gathering and conversations and work. Residences occupied by people and subject to a common government. Cities have inhabitants and visitors and bustling activity, cultural events, gatherings involving music, arts, education, religion, entertainment, and athletics. And there's nothing in the Bible that even hints at the fact that these kinds of things will not take place in heaven. The Bible never says that. But why do we imagine sometimes that, well, it's not really a city and and. We don't really know what's going to go. No, it really is a city and we really do know what's going to go on there. 
Because the Bible is so clear about it. We long for this. We long for an eternal habitation of peace. An eternal habitation of good. Even atheists butcher their own doctrines. Because atheists move from a type of hell to a type of heaven. Everything is, is borrowed from the truths of God. We desire this. We desire a physical dwelling because we're physical people. As I've said to you before, God wasn't born in heaven. He wasn't reared in heaven. He made it for us. And we are going to be a physical people. That's why we're going to have the study on our new bodies. We're going to be a physical people forever. Though God is spiritual, it doesn't mean he can't abide in heaven. He's manifested himself on earth. Fifteen times in Revelation 21 through 22, it is specifically called a city. A home that will not be destroyed. A kingdom that will not fade. A city unshakable with its foundations and incorruptible inheritance. Jesus spoke of it by saying, in my father's house are many mansions, many dwelling places. He talks about a mansion. He talks about a house. He talks about rooms. He talks about dwelling places. Why shouldn't we imagine that that's what it's like? Now, I believe it'll be something like we've never seen. I believe it'd be something like we've never seen on earth because this is just a shadow. It's not the reality. And this is cursed and where we're going is not cursed. But this is a good reference point to understand it. There is architecture, there are walls, there are streets, there are other features of the city that seem to suggest and tell us it is indeed not a figure of speech. Heaven is described as a garden, a city, and a kingdom. Because gardens, cities, and kingdoms are familiar to us, they give us a bridge of understanding. Though the idea of earth as heaven's shadow is seldom discussed, it is a biblical concept. I want you to read this with me in Romans 1.20. The Bible tells us here in Romans 1.20, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So the things that are invisible, which is heaven, and things of that nature right now are visible to us, They can be clearly understood by the things that have been made. So we can have some kind of understanding of what it will be like by understanding what we're living in. God is the architect of the new Jerusalem. The Bible tells us about this city, that the temple is there, the temple of God and of the Lamb, that it is filled with the smoke of the glory of God. There are scrolls in heaven. There are elders in heaven. There are martyrs in heaven who wear clothes. There are people in heaven with palm branches in their hands. There are musical instruments in heaven. There are horses in heaven, eagles in heaven. Enoch and Elijah have both been transported into heaven, and they are physical people. They have not received a glorified body yet. They're still in flesh and blood. And they're in heaven. It has to be a physical place for these physical bodies. Now, they're not going to stay that way forever. They're going to receive new bodies. But right now, they're in heaven in flesh and blood bodies. They can't inherit it like that, but they're visiting it like that. And so it has to be a physical place. John and Paul both visited this third heaven. Jesus intended for us to envision heaven and hell as real places. Where real people from earth will eventually go. There will be many cities on the eternal earth. Many cities and many kingdoms and kings will reign throughout all of eternity on earth. These kings of these nations that are going to be on the earth in the eternal age are going to be able to go up into the new Jerusalem the city of God, and they're going to bring their glory into that city. They're going to be able to go up into that city and visit it and bring to God and his throne the glory of their kingdoms and honor him and worship him. But no city will be like this one, for it is the home of the king of kings. Heaven's capital city will be visually magnificent beyond anything that we could ever comprehend. 
It comes out of heaven from God to earth. We don't know exactly what that's going to look like or what it's going to be. But this city is called the holy city, the bride, the lamb's wife, the tabernacle of God, the great city, the heavenly Jerusalem, for it's the headquarters of God and of the lamb and the seat of world government. It is the city of the living God. Jesus said it was my father's house. The inhabitants of this city is God, the Lamb of God, the innumerable angels that are around serving the Lord. And it is the home of Old Testament believers and the church of Jesus Christ. The saints live there. Its glory is brighter than the sun and the moon and the stars. As a matter of fact, it says there's no need of the sun or the moon. It doesn't say there won't be a sun or moon. It just says there's no need of it. Because the glory and the brightness of the Lamb of God will give it an eternal day. He is so bright and so fair and so wonderful. The appearance of this city is clear as crystal. There's nothing to hide. And there's nothing to hide from. Because there's nothing about you that is unholy. Everything is absolute perfection. It is surrounded by a jasper wall 250 feet high. Twelve gates of pearl with the twelve tribes of Israel written into them. Twelve angels stationed at each gate that never closes. Twelve foundations on which the apostles' names are written. Streets of clear gold, transparent. There are at least twelve streets that run through this city and, and surely and possibly many, many more. For there are twelve gates of entry. That people will walk on these streets. There are streets people are going to walk. There are rivers. There are mansions. There are fountains of water. There are animals. There's a floor in the throne room of God that's like a sea of glass. It's 1,500 miles square in cube. And the mountains and the valleys are mansions with streams of living water. Heaven is life in its fullest sense. Life in its fullest enjoyments. In its fullest productivity. It's fullest character. Everything is there. The book of life, the crown of life, the river of life, the tree of life, the water of life, the spirit of life, the bread of life, the giver of life, the Lord of life. Heaven is the city of life and everything else is the city of death. And what is all of this about? What is all of this about? It's about you. It's about a place for you to live with God forever and ever and ever. It's the way he wanted it. Well, can you prove that to me in the scriptures? Yes, I can. I'm glad you asked. Jesus prayed in John 17, 24. Father, I will that they also whom you've given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me for you've loved them. Before the foundation of the world, the desire of Jesus was for his bride. May my bride be with me forever and see the glory that you have given me before the foundations of the earth. What a compliment to rebels and enemies that God would transform us into a bride, into daughters and sons. That the creator of the universe would go to such great lengths, though it took nothing for him to create this, to prepare for us a place that we can behold and participate in and see his glory. In the future lessons that we're going to do, we're going to talk about what are we going to be doing in heaven and in our new bodies. And we're going to see all the productivity that we do. It's not boring. It's going to be full of activity and adventure. And it's going to be absolutely wonderful what God has intended and what he has planned for us. But Jesus wants you to be with him and he wants to be with his father. And he's going to come and get you and bring you to his father's house. That is going to happen very, very soon. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will be able to go. Only those Those who have been born again, who have surrendered their hearts and their lives to Jesus Christ. I pray that's you. There's a lot of people who think they're going to meet Jesus when he comes. And they're going to be in for, I believe, one of the greatest shocks of their whole life when he says, I never knew you. I never knew you. We have no relationship. You're not going with me. 
I would ask you and I would encourage you right now not to take this for granted because the most important decision you will ever make is to not just simply sit there and say, yes, I know the Lord. But to pray a prayer that would beseech God, please know me. Whatever you have to do, know me. Make me yours. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. I do not want to miss this eternal life with you. Pray that right now. Take nothing for granted. This is your eternity that is before you. And so make sure of this. And when it is sure, God will give you the Holy Spirit who will bear witness with your spirit that you are indeed God's child. Isn't that a beautiful provision? He will let you know. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that you've given us such a beautiful promise, such an eternal city, city with foundations, a, a habitation that's secure, where there is no evil, where nothing evil enters into it, where nothing evil will continue or grow or fester. So thank you, God, that you will deliver us from evil. The evil of our own selves, our own hearts, our own imaginations, our thoughts. We will be so holy, so pure. I thank you for the blood of Jesus, which alone could do this. I thank you that you have prepared a place for us. Oh, please let our affections be set there. If we're called upon to joyfully see the spoiling of our goods. Maybe a new pandemic this year. Maybe a new one next year. And the whole world's afraid. If we could be of good cheer, you've overcome the world. But our God is the physician. Father, we pray that people all over would put their hope in you. I pray for India, the crisis that they're in, Father, with sickness and disease. The thousands and the tens of thousands of Hindus, Father, that are perishing as they turn to Hindu gods to no avail. Father, let them turn to Jesus and let them be saved. God, let healing come to this land in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. I give you glory, God. I praise you, God. Thank you, Lord, not for heaven in itself, but thank you for the promise that you're there. The Lamb is there. And I'm going to get to see you face to face. What a hope. What a promise. We love you. We worship you, Jesus. Just spend time worshiping the Lord. Call upon God today. Make sure you're saved. Make sure that God knows you. Make sure that God knows you. Live a life of faith. Life of liberty. Supernatural life. As you look to Jesus for all things.